Good morning. morning. Want to welcome everybody here. It's good to see a big crowd today, and welcome to those that are joining us online. Got a few things. Uh, if you get a chance, look look over the bulletin, and there's some updates on some some people we've been been talking about. Um, last night, Shelley visited with Marilyn on the phone. I'd like to give you a little bit of update on that. Her knee surgery went well. Uh, she came home yesterday. Um, thought she was she thought she was going to get to go into the hospital for a couple weeks with Medicare, but they uh, they denied that right now. So she is at home, and uh, Joy was Joy will be her daughter will be with her for the rest of the week this week. So, uh, but because of that, uh, we're going to coordinate with the Stafford ladies, uh, church ladies, to take her some lunches for. A couple weeks, and going to going to alternate alternate days on that. Our first responsibility will be on this coming Wednesday. Uh, Shelley is putting together uh, a list. If you were interested in helping, uh, please talk to her about that. A couple things that are coming up that we need to start focusing on. Uh, first is uh, VBS. We're going to be planning some things here coming, but at least wanted to bring that to your attention, and and uh, that'll be here before we know it. But but just be aware that soon we'll be uh, be talking about that. Also, just an announcement: the women walking with the women walking with God conference is coming up in April, and there's there's a sign up sheet available. So, all right, great to have everybody here today. Look forward to worshiping with you. my scripture go ahead and prepare for the uh, your for the loaf bread I will be sharing uh, to you from the book of Matthew this morning uh, the 26th chapter and, and I encourage you to reread the chapter that's an assignment for you <laughs> sometimes I'm more motivated if somebody gives me an assignment but I, I like to read that chapter at, at your leisure but I specifically want to focus on uh, verse 39 of this chapter. I think it's, uh, I try to myself, try to put myself in someone's shoes, try to understand the circumstances and the the emotions, the feelings of what's going on in in any circumstance. And and this one is very uh, uh, moving, I, I find, this particular verse in verse 39. Jesus, of course, is at Gethsemane with, uh, with Peter and, and James and John. They're kind of away from the other group. And, and Jesus said, uh, going a little farther, he fell with his face to the ground and prayed, My Father, if it is possible, may this cup be taken away from me, yet not as I will, but as you will. A couple of things I want to note and wanted to challenge you to think about. One, Jesus fell to the ground, his face to the ground. Now, when I've done that myself, I, I'm pretty desperate and pretty motivated. Um, and so, you know, that really helps me see, have insight and, in, you know, what was going on in Jesus' mind. But think, I want you to think about in your own life or in your own experiences about, t- you know, times when you didn't want to go through with something, how what a struggle it was. You know, I've shared with you that in the past that it's a struggle for me to go to the dentist. I can, I can procrastinate and figure out every way not to go to the dentist because I don't want to do it. But that's nothing compared to what Jesus did. But there was a circumstance in my life, and I share that not to bring attention to myself, but it helps me to relate to what took place with Jesus. When my son Todd was in the hospital, uh, they were to give him another inserts another IV in his arm. And, and he knew because if they got another IV, that was means he's going to be very, very sick from chemotherapy again. He didn't want to do it. He cried. He begged me not to let them do this. And the nurses required me to hold him while they hold him down while they put the IVs in him. And it was a very traumatic thing. And, and I remember that. And, and I... 
that helps me to reflect that, you know, what Jesus was feeling was, was you know, very similar. He knew what was coming. He knew about the floggings. He knew about being spit on, about all the disgusting things that are going to take place in his life. But he did it for me. And I'm humbled at that. So I challenge you, when, when you partake of these emblems, think about, you know, how we can sometimes not want to go through with something, but Jesus did. He went through for it, this for us. And I'm humbled and thankful. Let's, partake, let's pray and then we'll partake of the bread. Our Father, we're so thankful for your Son and his love for us and that he was willing to go to the cross for us to have his body nailed uh, to the cross, to endure great uh, pain and affliction uh, for us. And we, we fully admit that we are helpless for, for being forgiven without that and to be, you know, that cleansing we're so thankful for. And as we partake of this emblem, we remember the cost that was involved and his willingness to follow through. And we ask these things through Christ. Amen. Let's go to our Father in prayer. Our Father, we're thankful for, again, for Jesus and the sacrifice of his life. And we recognize the shedding of his blood that took place. And we know that without uh, that, we would stand unacceptable, that we would have no, no hope of eternity with you. But we recognize the great power and of that sacrifice and we're so thankful that it cleanses us continually even though our walks sometimes are, are down paths that we, we shouldn't go and we try not to go we realize that we are still your grace and your, your forgiveness is still offered to us and we're thankful for that and we ask these things through Christ Amen Wow, it's great to be here today. Have the gang back. Uh, George, Shirley, good to have you here. Teddy, Carol, uh, so many. Thank you for being here. There is a concept in the English language that is one of the most beautiful concepts imaginable. The word is reconciliation. And we think about reconciliation. Reconciliation follows on alienation, on separation, of being torn apart. And who hasn't experienced that? Uh, friends that are no longer friends, families, husbands, wives, brothers, sisters, and the worst, the worst alienation of all is being alienated from God. Open your Bibles with me, please, to the Gospel of Luke, chapter 19. And this is one of my favorite Bible stories. I know I say that every week, but this one brings back memories of being a child in Bible school. Do you remember? Zacchaeus was a wee little man, and a wee little man was he. He climbed up in us. I, I won't sing the whole song. I won't torture you like that. But I love the story of Zacchaeus. Let's read it one more time from Luke chapter 19, beginning in verse 1. Jesus entered Jericho and was passing through. A man was there by the name of Zacchaeus. He was a chief tax collector and was wealthy. He wanted to see who Jesus was, but being a short man, he could not because of the crowd. So he ran ahead and climbed a sycamore tree to see him since Jesus was coming that way. Now let's pause for just a second. Use your sanctified imaginations and see yourself there in the ancient city of Jericho. It's called the City of Palms. It was famous for the date palms. It was kind of like Palm Springs of the ancient world. It was where Herod had his 
winter palace where he could go and be warm. It was a, a big city. It was the crossing point of the Jericho River. Uh, excuse me. Jordan River, <laughs> the Jordan River. You know, the pilgrims would come down from, from Galilee and they would cross over the Jordan River and come down through the Decapolis cities, the Greek cities, so they didn't have to go through Samaria. Dangers for Jews who were on their way to the temple. And so four times a year during the great feast in Jerusalem, the Jews of Galilee would cross the Jordan River and they would come down and then they would cross back at the fords where John the Baptist preached as they would come into the city of Jericho and begin that long winding trail through the cliffs. You remember that's where uh, uh, the poor man was beaten and left for dead by, by robbers. They would climb that narrow gorge all the way up to the beautiful city of Jerusalem. And suddenly there would be the temple. It was a grand time. And can you imagine yourself being with the crowd coming down from Galilee, walking 70 miles to worship the Lord? And as they would walk, somebody would begin singing the Psalms of Ascent, and they would all sing together. It was a joyous, joyous encampment with anticipation of what they were going to see and what they were going to do. And even more important than that, Jesus was with them. Now, these are the people, the villagers from Galilee, and they knew Jesus. If they hadn't seen Jesus, they had certainly heard what Jesus had done, healing the sick, casting out demons, giving sight to the blind, even, it said, raising the dead, multiplying loaves and fishes. And Jesus is with them, and he is on his way to Jerusalem, and we are marching with him, and surely Jesus will do something to end the corruption that characterized the temple. Jesus is our hero. Jesus is our leader. Maybe Jesus is the Messiah. Can you feel the enthusiasm? Can you feel the excitement? And as word reaches Jericho that Jesus is coming, everyone rushed out of their homes, rushed out of their shops to line the streets to see this man of God. And that included a man by the name of Zacchaeus. Now, we know three things about Zacchaeus. Number one, he's not just a tax collector. He is a chief tax collector. Now, a tax collector today is an honorable occupation, but in those days, it was a synonym for corruption. They were evil men who worked for the Roman government. They were traitors to their people. They didn't keep the law of Moses. They gave up everything, friends and family, for power and wealth. And Zacchaeus was chief among them. You have to ask yourself, why? Well, we also know that Zacchaeus was a wee little man. He was a short man. And maybe he had been bullied as a kid. That happens even today. And so he thought about I will get power. I will get money. He traded all of the things that make life worthwhile for power and money. He was a tax collector, and he was rich, and he was also short. Now, if you were lining the streets of Jericho to see Jesus come by and we see the pilgrim throng, you can imagine uh, Zacchaeus trying to, to see the crowd. You know, he's looking this way, he's looking that way, jumping up, and everybody around sees Zacchaeus. And if he's trying to come around this side, you just kind of say, hey, we're going to have some fun with it. Oh, we'll just have some fun with this guy. We'll keep him there. We'll, nobody likes Zacchaeus. He was a chief tax collector. He was a traitor to Israel. And so we're going to do everything in our power to poke fun at him and to take advantage of him. Finally, Zacchaeus looked ahead and he saw a tree. Maybe there was a ladder. Maybe there wasn't. Uh, sycamore trees have lots of branches. They're, they're easy to climb. And so Zacchaeus, a grown man in his rich robes, you can see 
the finely woven fabric. You can see the ornamentation and the jewels, the bling, we might say. And we can see this grown man run ahead, and he decides to climb up in this tree. And he's sitting there on a branch, thinking, I'm pretty smart. I figured this thing out. Meanwhile, the crowd is whispering, hey, look over in that tree. <laughs> and man, and Zacchaeus, what a loser. But Zacchaeus is sitting up there, and here comes the crowd as they're, as they're marching by. All the Galileans, the pilgrims, they're singing together. They're chanting. They're waving to the others, encouraging the people of Jericho, join us as we march to Jerusalem for the Passover feast. Let's keep reading. You have your Bible open? And when Jesus reached the spot, he looked up. Don't admit. He looked up. Do you see it? What's Zacchaeus doing? Zacchaeus is looking down. Jesus is walking along, and then Jesus stops and looks up. Do you see what happens when their eyes meet? Zacchaeus is feeling pretty good about things, being creative and all. And suddenly he's filled with embarrassment. Do you see his face turn red? And do you see the whole crowd come to a stop and everybody is looking at the grown man in the tree? And they're snickering, look at that. And you can just feel Zacchaeus. He's a small man already, but he's getting smaller and smaller. He just wishes there was some place he could hide. And when Jesus reached the spot, he looked up and said to him, Zacchaeus, how did Jesus know his name? Do you think Zacchaeus was shocked? Zacchaeus, come down immediately. I must stay at your house today. What? All the crowd is listening? They, what? Jesus is going to Zacchaeus' house. How does Zacchaeus respond? So he came down at once and welcomed him gladly. All the people saw this and began to murmur, he's gone to be the guest of a sinner. But Zacchaeus stood up and said to the Lord, look, Lord, here and now I give half of my possessions to the poor, and if I've cheated anybody out of anything, I will pay back four times the amount. And Jesus said to him, Today salvation has come to this house, because this man too is a son of Abraham. Do you see the shock in all the people who heard that? For the Son of Man came to seek and save what is lost. Wow. Wow. Now, uh, notice the order of events. Zacchaeus meets Jesus, and Zacchaeus gives half of everything that he has. Now, did Jesus come to Zacchaeus because Zacchaeus had made a promise? Did Zacchaeus earn the, the honor of having Jesus stay in his home? No. It came from the reconciliation. Zacchaeus is plagued with his past. Open your Bibles now to our lesson from the epistles. Colossians chapter 1, verse 21. In Colossians chapter 1, verses 21 through 23, Paul will talk about our past, our present, and our future. For Zacchaeus, his past was his alienation. As he turned his back on his family, as he turned his back on his friends, as he turned his back on his nation, as he gave up everything for money and for power. That's his past. His present, Jesus came to his house. 
and Zacchaeus' future? Son of Abraham. All right, have you found Colossians chapter 1, verses 21 through 23? Paul says once, that's our past, once you were alienated from God and were enemies in your minds because of your evil behavior. That describes Zacchaeus. And if we're honest about it, that describes us as well. We have all made bad decisions. We have all experienced alienation and separation in friends, relationships, but most importantly, with God. At verse 22, but now, that was our present alienation, but now, that's our present. But now he has reconciled you by Christ's physical body through death to present you holy in his sight without blemish and free from accusation. But now, we were alienated from God. We were separated from God. But now, because of Jesus, we've been made friends again. But now, because of Jesus, our relationship with God is made whole. God never turned his back on us. God is our heavenly father. God loves us even when we don't love him. God loves us even when we turn our back on him. God loves us even when we get down in the mud and get down and dirty and sin and bring shame, shame on ourselves, our family, and our Lord. God continues to love us and sent his son Jesus Tom, thank you for a very powerful thought during the Lord's Supper this morning. That really moved me. God sent his son and Jesus was willing to die. Paul says physical death brought us together with God again. That alienation, that thing that separated, that thing that divided us is gone. We've been brought together with God again. And how does Paul describe it in verse 22? To present you holy in his sight. You are holy. Once you were a scoundrel. Once you were a sinner. Once you had turned your back on God. But now. Isn't that a beautiful phrase? But now. We're holy. But now, without blemish, that means our past has been wiped away. But now, we're free from accusation. Yes, I was a sinner. I have done things that I hope never reach the light of day. I am so sorry, so embarrassed, so ashamed of what I have done. But now, doesn't that just make you tangle? Doesn't that lift your spirit? We've talked about the past. We've talked about the present. Let's go to verse 23 and look at our future. If you continue in your faith, established and firm, not move from the hope held out in the gospel, this is the gospel that you heard and that has been proclaimed to every creature under heaven and of which I, Paul, have become a servant. The phrase I want us to focus, is on, focus on is the hope of the gospel. In the past, we were alienated. In the present, we've been reconciled. And our future, our hope, think about the hope that we have in Christ I just listed seven this past week. I'm sure there are more. Share them with me, if you will. But the first hope that we have in Christ Jesus is that Jesus is coming back. We need leaders. We need somebody who knows right from wrong. We need someone to put this world in order again. Paul says even the creation cries out for redemption, 
for Jesus to come back and stop the pollution, stop the ugliness, stop what's going on in our world and bring it all together. I have hope that Jesus is coming back. Number two, I have hope of a resurrection. I have hope of a glorious body. I've got so many questions about that. A great day is coming. According to Paul, as he writes to the Thessalonians, he says that that there's a day coming when the dead in Christ will rise. And they're not going to precede us. They're not going to go rocketing by, but they're going to be resurrected. And then arm and arm will join them in the sky. Oh, man, we're going to be resurrected. And we will have a resurrection body. Does that mean I'm going to be 68 for all eternity? My gray hair is stuck with me. My ears are stuck with me. No. Paul says in the last chapter of Corinthians that we will have a glorious body. He tries to describe it. He says, if you could picture this, take a a, a seed, maybe wheat or maybe corn, And our new body is going to have about as much relationship with our old body as a a grain of seed has to the full-grown, glorious crop. Think about Jesus. Jesus had a body. Now, in the ancient world, the test for a ghost, ghosts don't eat. Angels don't eat. And so when the angel appeared to Gideon, Gideon went and made a really scrumptious lunch and brought it back and set it before the angel. And he would have known if the angel would have eaten it that he wasn't an angel. But it went up in fire along with the angel. It was proof. The disciples saw Jesus. And the proof that Jesus was resurrected and not just a ghost was the fact that he sat down and had breakfast with him. He ate fish and he ate bread. Thomas touched Jesus. Jesus had a body, but it's not like an ordinary body. The body of Christ could walk through locked doors and locked windows. It was a resurrected body, a glorious body. And we have hope that we're going to have a glorious body too. I may have aches and pains and have to have a bowl full of pills for breakfast, but that's going away. I have hope of a glorious body in the resurrection. Third, I'm not going to be alone on that great day. We'll see our loved ones. We've had to be separated from Todd for a while. But there's a great day coming. We've had to be separated from from Gladys for a while. From our loved ones for a while. But there is a great day coming when we will all be resurrected together. Can you imagine? I live for that hope. And number four, we're going to have fellowship. It's going to be a party like you can't imagine. It's going to be a celebration, and I have hope that I'll be there for it too. And it won't be temporary. The resurrection is for all time, where we never grow old, where we're never touched by tears again. God will dry all tears. There'll be no more sadness. There'll be no worry In your room in the mansion of God, there's no lock on the door because you don't need it. There are no burglar alarms because you don't need it. There are no sticks to put in the steering wheel of your car because you don't need it. There is a great day coming full of eternal life. And finally, I have hope of an inheritance from my heavenly Father. There's a gift package waiting. What a glorious day it's going to be. I want you to think about it right now. Think about your past. Maybe some of you are still living in your past. Stained and ugly. Full of embarrassment and shame. It doesn't have to be that way. Because in our present, Jesus has died to reconcile us with God to make you holy. You 
3rd as we leave this week, as you face all of the challenges, because this life is a challenge, as you face the pain and the tears, because this life is hard, I want you to lift your heart with hope. Think about that great day. Think about that new body. Think about that inheritance. Think about being with the Lord forever. Think about that grand celebration. And we're going to celebrate right now as we sing this next hymn. God bless. Let's pray together. As we close this service, dear Lord, we're thankful for Jesus. And let us, as we leave today and begin a new week, let us focus on the great hope there is for each of us. And may we have strong faith. But most of all, Lord, let us have love for each other. This prayer we've asked in Jesus' name. Amen.